Hi, Megan. Hi, Bob. How you doing? I'm pretty well. How are you doing? I cannot complain. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright. Uh, this is The Wright Show, available both on video streaming and audio podcast. This edition of The Wright Show will be on Meaning of Life TV. You are Megan McArdle, famous uh, writer, journalist, uh, with a kind of specialty in economics and a certain uh, libertarian bent, author of The Upside of Down, about the virtues of failure. Um, you write for Bloomberg. It's a lovely Christmas gift. It's good for sure. propping up shaky tables. To set your loved ones up for a year of failure. Yeah, to prepare <laughs> them. Um, you write for Bloomberg View, and you have kindly agreed to come on and talk about the meaning of life. We're doing I have. this. In addition, see, we talk to like people whose credentials actually qualify them to talk about the meaning of life, like philosophers, psychologists, theologians. Then we also talk to luminaries like you about their lives and the meaning or lack therein, as the case may be. I like to think that my life has meaning. Well, that was going to be uh, my first question. Does your life have meaning? I think so. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer uh, that life has purpose and meaning, although I don't always know what it is at the time. Now, purpose is an interesting choice of words. Do you mean that there is some kind of a larger purpose that humans are part of, or do you just mean that it's up to the individual to, to settle on an individual purpose? No, I think there is a larger purpose. Uh, I suppose I think it's uh, to live a good life, by which I suppose I mean a virtuous life. Okay. I'm a little surprised by that, because, I mean, not that that not that saying there's a larger purpose. It's, it's shocking to hear me say that when you look at the wreckage of my... That is not the That is not the irony I was going to focus on, no. It's more that I think of you as a libertarian, and for whatever reason, I think of libertarians, perhaps this all derives from Ayn Rand or something, as being so thoroughgoingly atheist as to not want to talk about higher purpose of any kind. Well, as a matter of fact, though, Ayn Rand... Uh, was an extreme believer in higher purpose, but she sort of filtered that through the individual, right? So she believed that you had a kind of affirmative moral duty to live up to the highest that was possible in yourself. Okay. Um, and she had a sort of romantic and universalist conception of what that highest was. Okay, now am I wrong to think that she did consider herself an atheist? Oh yes, I think she's a she rabbit. So then where would she say that the higher purpose derives from? If well, that all gets a little misty. Yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should say that I am, I am, uh, I'm by no means a great expert on the philosophy of Ayn Rand, although she did publish uh, a number of works on the subject. But you see this in her novels, where she is making a straightforwardly universalist moral argument about what is right and what is wrong. She just believes that that right and wrong are focused on the capabilities of the individual. Mm -hmm. And if, like, I have to say that in some ways this is the most attractive. I don't find Ayn Rand, uh, I mean, she's a sort of turgid novelist. Uh, and I find her mental model of how people work sort of astonishingly and, and risibly inaccurate. Hmm. Um, so I think that the best parts of her work are, first of all, she's very good at describing how communism screws things up. Uh, she over identifies communism and things that aren't. Um, but in terms of she watched, you know, she watched what happened in Russia and she's a good chronicler hmm. of what that looks like in individual lives. Uh, her best novel is probably her first novel, I think her first novel, uh, a novel called We the Living, which was actually set in Soviet Russia. And what did she get wrong about human nature, in your view? Well, she, you know, so you see this, I think, best in Atlas Shrugged, is that she has the, the uh, protagonist, the hero, Dagny Taggart, who is a kind of thinly disguised, much better looking version of Ayn Rand. Um... She, I mean, like, I'm not, she said she, I mean, what's actually interesting about her, she very much admired beautiful people, and she was, 
very well aware of what she looked like. Uh, I, I say that not insulting. Was she unattractive? I've never really paid much attention to it. And she of course, was these not. She subjective. was not the best looking person you ever met. Um, I wouldn't say she was hideously ugly, but she certainly wasn't. She was plain. She had a passionate love affair with a young guy, didn't she, or not? Yes, with one of her acolytes. But yeah. this is actually this is actually where I'm going. So we'll get. She's a so she libertarian cougar. She runs her through three men. Uh -huh. And each of the three men gives her the two. Two of the three men give her up because she's found an even more awesome man named John Galt, who they all kind of hero worship. Uh -huh. And this is a non. A, a, and they give her up because you know they they still love her, but they know that she doesn't love them anymore. That she's only giving that you know she's she's only going to have sex with him from now on and so forth. And she writes these scenes in which they're like, well, of course I would never want you to sacrifice yourself for my sake or, and this is like, this is a completely ridiculous model of how people are. Um, this is not how people react to these things. And indeed when this happened to Ayn Rand, because she did embark on this, uh, love affair with Nathaniel Brandon, who was one of her acolytes and she and her, she and he announced to their spouses that they were going to do this and that they had to accept this because this was obviously um, you know, within objectivist principles, um, he was her successor. That's the only reason I know that I would ever have a love affair is if, exactly. it, were, if it were within I mean, objectivist principles. I feel principles. most of us yeah. think about that is, is what do my objectivist principles tell me about having this love affair? Right. Uh, and that since she, he was her handpicked successor and she was the leader of the movement that obviously they had to sleep together and expected the spouses to accept this, um, which is horrifying. Uh, it was just sort of horrifyingly callous towards their spouses. And then when he eventually started having affairs with younger women, I mean, she was at this point in her late fifties. Uh -huh. And I say this as a woman in her forties, who's not necessarily pleased to know that younger women are more attractive than I am. Um, this is nonetheless a fact about the world. And she got really horrifyingly angry. Well, maybe that, his that, affair was not within objectivist principles. Right, because they were with women who weren't as mentally... Oh, well, or, there you go. Uh, ...as she was. No, is that she didn't even know about herself how she would react in this situation. Right. And in general, you know, her villains are way overblown. They have no motivation other than doing evil. Uh, there's a lot of problems with her books. But what she's actually... The best parts, I think, of her books are the parts in which she's calling people to to find the greatness within themselves and pursue it mm -hmm. um, single-mindedly. And I, I think that that is, you know, that is her vision is find the greatness within yourself, pursue it single-mindedly. And that in some way that that is its own very strong moral calling, uh, which you are not morally entitled to say no to. Uh, which brings us back to the larger purpose of your life. So it is to, it is to realize the, the greatness within Megan. <laughs> I don't know if the word greatness is a word that I <laughs> normally apply. Well, to it is to be the best. Me it is to be the best Megan that Megan can be. Yes, I think that that is. Um, okay. And and you know, you know, in the end, uh, there's a there's a I believe Martin Amos said this, although it may have been Kingsley. It's one of the Amoses, anyway. <laughs> I get them mixed up too. Um, in an interview, he said, you know, in the end, it's all how well you did with women and how well you did with children and the fame and the rest of it. Uh, and Van Morrison recently gave an interview which said, you know, in the end, you have more money or less, but, you know, you're still here. Um, and I, I think that that's also right. In the end, the, the thing that matters most is, is probably the people that you loved and the people that you touched on an individual level, not, you know... But, you know, then there's art and, and many artists are kind of terrible parents and terrible human beings, but they create this great art precisely because they're willing to sacrifice everything else to it. Mm -hmm. so maybe that's not, you know, in, in my own life, I, I, I suppose, a life, what the Roman idea of a life well lived. Um, so what does that entail? That, so that's like entails, like you're like this Renaissance person who like does it all? No, no, I think that it... Maybe maybe the answer is that it, it consists in finding um, your best capacities and stretching them, uh, whatever they are. Some people are really not set up to be parents or spouses or uh, what have you, but they're set up to do something else. But whatever it is, to, mm -hmm. uh, to do it as well as you possibly can. And how important is the career part for you? 
for me, I mean, well, you know, uh, I don't have kids, uh, and I do have a spouse. I try to be a good spouse. Uh, sadly, I'm sure I, I fail quite often, as one does. We could ask him. <laughs> Is he you there? Could. Um, he knows better than to answer that question in public. Okay. Uh, at least with anything other than my wife is the best wife ever. Um, no, I think that, uh, you know, so yes, for me, my career is a big part of what I do. It's a big part of what gives my life meaning because it, but you know, ultimately I think the reason it gives my life meaning is partly that I do it for my own enjoyment, right? Like partly I just, I like writing and I like what I write and I like the, I like the process of, of putting something on paper and having ideas and thinking things through. But I also really, you know, I have an unusually large and active and loyal comment section. And that matters to me a lot too, is that the, the people you who, mean at Bloomberg view or where everywhere, my, my commenters have followed me basically since the beginning, mm -hmm. not all of them, right? I pick up new ones. I lose some of our old friends. Um, but I have loyal commenters and I care about them a lot. You know, the reason I have loyal commenters is that I know who they are. I, I have conversations with them. I've been managing my comment threads and active in them since 2001 when I started blogging. And, you know, they're kind of a proxy for my readers, many of whom never comment or write me or do anything else, is that, you know, I think about those people as there are people out there who get a little bit of enjoyment, maybe have their own little ideas um, because of something I wrote, and, and that gives me great satisfaction. Mm. We have commenters uh, at Blogging Heads and Meaning of Life, too, but some of them seem not to think highly of me. Uh, many of them, as I recall, didn't think highly of me either. Well, so we, I, I, would, I guess we, we feel like returning the favor then. But we will. Well, no, you know, I, I, uh, I'm like, I, I have lots of commenters who don't like me. They come basically to, it's like they, they come and they bring their sharp stick and they jab at me. Um, and I'm fond of them, too. Some of my most fond uh some of the commenters I'm most fond of, uh, past are not, are not fond of you, ironically. <laughs> are very the, much not fond of the, me. The, uh, so, you know, I think libertarians tend to have loyal commenters, and this leads to a question. I mean, libertarians are a little like a tribe, and somebody just recently, maybe it was David Korn, underscored the, the irony of libertarianism being a, a doctrine that is so much about individual expression, the pursuit of individual freedom, and so on, and yet libertarians seeming kind of tribal. Uh, you know, you know what I mean. the the, bo the bottom line question is, if if it's true that you are kind of a a, mo a cohesive movement, a tribe, or something, is that a big source of meaning in your life? I think one's your value commitments. If your value commitments aren't a source of meaning in life, what is, right? right? If living up to if living up to your values is not a source of the meaning in your life, then you you don't have meaning at all. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, partly because it's what I believe, although my beliefs have certainly changed over the past twenty years. Um, but also partly because it's a community that I'm immersed in, right? A lot of my, some of my best friends are libertarians. It's just some of my best friends are liberals. Some of my best friends are conservatives. It's, uh, I mean, I'm ecumenical on that score, but what it is, is it's a cohesive community and it's more cohesive in a lot of ways than liberals and conservatives in part because it's smaller. Well, and, and partly because it is long felt besieged, right? It's not as besieged as it used to be. I mean, 20, 20 years ago in DC, it, they were just dismissed as cranks. I mean, you, this was oh, kind of before still are, don't 25 they? years ago. No, they're much more mainstream now. Yes. Uh, well, partly because maybe they've moderated their their views. Some of them have have you know maybe there there are people who are called who are you know kind of libertarians or something. Anyway, we don't need to get into a taxonomy of ideology, but 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 being besieged, I, I think you know one source of meaning can be being part of a movement, a tribe, and in a way, the more besieged you are, the more meaning there is. Absolutely. And, you know, the, um, if you think about this, I was thinking about this recently with the Irish community in America, where my dad grew up with this very cohesive sense of being Irish. But in part, he grew up with that sense because, you know, when he went to college, and this is in the, the 60s, this is not early 60s, but this is not, like, back in the dark ages. Um he went to a Catholic college within a larger university. 
Mm-hmm. It was not Catholic. And the other students made fun of them for being Catholic. Hmm. But that was a thing that happened in living memory in the United States. Wow. And there were jobs that, you know, were sort of not really within reach for people who were not white Anglo-Saxon Protestant males. And that, that sense of being excluded also created a stronger sense of being included, right? Mm-hmm. And that is certainly the case, is that for anyone, the people who are most comfortable certainly to talk politics with are the people who agree with you because they don't yell at you. And they don't say, how can you think that? You're a terrible human being. And all of the other things that come with arguing across ideological lines. Um, and so that's part of what creates a community. Part of it is just the fact that we're small, is that you know, we're a minority in politics. And part of it is also that we never get into power. So I like to say being a libertarian means you never have to say you're sorry Mm -hmm. because nothing you propose ever happens. I mean, sort of like, Uh, I I don't know. I think little bits of it happen here and there. I think no one can say your crazy libertarian agenda caused the financial crisis because my crazy libertarian agenda was not within a thousand miles. Right. Your agenda was much crazier than oh, the yeah, agenda wait. that actually took effect, I agree. <laughs> My agenda, well, so I would, I would dispute that because I'm, a, you know, like I'm a, I'm a squishy libertarian. I get expelled from the movement a lot by mm-hmm. random people who say Megan McArdle's not a real libertarian from mm-hmm. both the left and the right. The best part is I, a lot of liberals will expel me from the movement because I've say written something about abortion statistics. Even from a pro-choice perspective, if I say, well, these terrible abortion statistics that the pro-choice movement is using. Um, is are they're bad and we shouldn't use them? Um, that people would say, well, you know, no real libertarian could do anything that would support pro-lifers, which is first of all false on a matter of libertarian ideology. Mm-hmm. You do not have to be pro-choice to be a libertarian. And second of all, you know, you do not have the authority, random left-wing person, <laughs> to, to define what a, a, a real libertarian is. But I am a squish, and so I'd already. You know, I, I've been at odds with the movement on a lot of stuff about the, the financial crisis. I supported TARP. Uh, I was a big fan of the FDIC long before um, this happened because I actually, this is the sort of intervention I think that, that government should do in, in the middle of financial crises is you go in and you kind of stop things from getting worse. Um, and so, and I've, I've long been saying, you know, yes, there were some government regulations that made the financial crisis worse, but you can't say that this was caused by Fannie and Freddie or caused by the Community Reinvestment Act, that, that there were a lot of complicated things. And mostly my explanation for it is that the market just got it wrong. Not even that there was fraud, not that the government made it happen, just that there was a bad feedback loop in the market. Um, and that has kind of put me on the outs with... Basically everyone. I am, I am like the only journalistic proponent. You're a tribe of one. I am a tribe of one on this. Um, so I've always, I've always been a bit of a squish um, on, the, on the financial stuff. Um, and some of the stuff I wasn't a squish on, I think I was wrong about. So, for example, I called for letting Bear Stearns fail. And after Lehman, I realized that that had, in fact, been a really, really stupid idea that I needed to rethink. And I have. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Now, this relates to what you said earlier about, you know, being kind of the best you you can be, being the way to realize meaning in life. And in your career, when you write, the question becomes, well, what is the criterion for being the best kind of writer you can be? Is, Is it about influence you ultimately have? Is that the gauge? Or is it just about telling the truth as you see it? Or is it just, or is it more aesthetic? Is it more like, wow, this was a beautifully structured column, whether or not anyone read it. Uh, what a great metaphor I came up with, and so on. Um, influence is not a consideration for me. Influence, no one had, I, first of all, I, I think the amount of influence that journalists have, certainly that opinion columnists have on the world, is really low. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's not not. None. I, I would say that influence-wise, but my proudest moment has been convincing, writing a piece on academia, on liberal bias in academia that convinced some um, conservatives that microaggression and structural racism were real. I completely failed to convince any liberals that liberal bias in academia was a real thing, but I wrote this sort of contrasting these two things, and a bunch of conservatives said, you know, when you put it like that for the first time I understood... Hmm 
what you what why people talk about this and okay I understand what people are saying when they say that there's like subtle racism I can't see um, so that's like a proud influence moment so I do try to do those things but I, we don't do very much of it most people who read me start out agreeing with me or they start out not agreeing with me and they're just reading me to hate me um, and there's there's also the problem, and this is probably less true of like just discrete columns, discrete you know that have like a very explicit recommendation or message. But I've also found that often people, what people get out of your work is not the message you actually meant to send. Sometimes I mean, quite the opposite message. Yeah, I mean I think it's particularly true of longer things like books. Yes. But uh, yeah. Although I, I will say with my book, you know, I with. I don't know if this is influence is the right word, but I've definitely had people who wrote like, wow, I read your book because it's about failure. And because I, I had sort of agonized about whether to talk about my own failures in the book. And I did because I thought no one ever does, mm -hmm. right? It's everyone's, everyone's really good at writing kind of abstract stuff about mm -hmm. how important it is to fail. And no one's like, wow, let me tell you about this time and how terrible it felt mm -hmm. and how embarrassed I am and how terrible and embarrassed I still feel while writing this passage, which was something I hadn't quite expected, mm -hmm. uh, but was true. It was like I relived every terrible humiliation and, and, uh, and anger, anguish. Um, is that people have said to me, you know, your book came to me when I was in a really bad moment and it really helped me. And that feels really good. That, that does feel really good. Because that's it, you know, because I, I know I've been there. I was unemployed, you know, I was unemployed for two years looking for a job. I had a, a long-term relationship that broke off just at the point where he said, do you want to get married? And then like three days later I said, I've changed my mind. We should move, you should move out. Um, the People are in those terrible moments. And the idea that someone had something like that and that my book, made them feel a little bit better right. or gave them the tools they needed to, to get themselves out of it. That's an incredibly good feeling. Mostly though, I think that the most important thing that I think of is to tell the truth. Yeah. And I love, you know, I love when I manage to coin a good phrase or be funny and someone compliments some paragraph that I came up with. But unless you are, you know, Proust or George Orwell, very few people are going to have that experience all the time where they're just drooling over your beautifully crafted lines. Um, I think the most important thing to me is that is to say things that are true and to not give in to the temptation to say things that are almost true or might be true as if you knew more than you did. And so the thing that I always try to do in my writing is to highlight my own uncertainties. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if I think about what I'm proudest about in my work, is that when I say, when I write about the minimum wage, or I write about anything, really, if I write about a new study, I'll say, look, this is one study. It, it's limited. You cannot generalize about the world from even a really good study. Um, and that's actually one of the themes I hit over and over, is the amount of uncertainty there in the world. I used to joke that uh, before they changed the Facebook statuses, that if my life were Facebook, if my kind of, mission statement where Facebook status, it would be it's complicated, is that like what I actually try to do in my work is say, this is what I think. Mm -hmm. Here are the reasons you might disagree with me. Mm -hmm. Here's why I don't think they're necessarily good arguments or I don't think they're strong enough or, you know, but that there's a lot of uncertainty in the world and here's some of the countervailing evidence as well as the five points that I'm going to align on my side. Because not enough people do that. I think there's more of it a little more than there used to be. Mm -hmm. Partly because we can write at greater length, right? Mm -hmm. We're not confined to the 700 word op-ed column where we used to be. Mm -hmm. But I always try to do that is like always start by arguing in good faith with your opponents. Don't say here is my stupid opponent who is just unremittingly evil and believes what they believe for unremittingly evil reasons. Um, even unremittingly evil people, aren't sitting, or even Hil Adolf Hitler did not get up in the morning and say, how could I be more evil? You know, somebody it, had to apologize for saying that. Some actor said that, and then, like, Abe Foxman got all over him or somebody, and he had to take it back. And that's kind of shocking to me. I am not in any way defending <laughs> Adolf Hitler. What I'm saying is that his mental process right. was not... Boy, I'm the most evil person on the planet. No, I, I totally what agree. Be the most evil thing I could do, right? Is that I, everyone? I totally has... agree. That, that if you don't realize that everyone who does what by your lights is a bad thing 
think has convinced themselves that they're doing a good thing, if you don't understand that about people, you are not in a strong position to combat evil. Because, or has at least sort of justified it to themselves, right? Like, yeah. do, I, do I think, I assume, maybe I am incorrect. I assume that somewhere inside them, the Nazis had some qualms about I'm what they sure were doing. I'm sure some did, but just by but, and yeah, large... but I think that they said, well, it's necessary. Right, right, right. that's what I mean. Did, they, you know, they come up, uh, we all have qualms, but at the end of the day, people are remarkably good at convincing themselves... Yes. That they are on the side of right, notwithstanding all the moral ambiguities and everything. And, and I just think, if you don't understand that about people, you're not equipped to deal with the world's problems. And, I, I agree with that. And, but, but the hard part is applying it to yourself. It's like, right? I mean, it's, it gets back to what you said about trying to acknowledge your, your uncertainties, but it, it kind of, the challenge goes beyond that in a certain way. Um, but anyway... We're not here for me to pontificate. We're here for you to pontificate. So <clears throat> back to this question about um, where you find meaning. Are you, so, so you think that, okay, first of all, to summarize, you think as far as your work life goes, it's about telling the truth, acknowledging uncertainties, ideally having a positive impact on people's lives. Um, and then in other realms, I'm sure in a social realm, it has to do with having a positive impact on, on uh, people's lives, uh, presumably. Um, but back to this, uh, the Ayn Rand question. You said she got kind of fuzzy when, when you asked her, well, where does this, where does the larger purpose derive from um, if there is no God? Now, uh, I'm, I'm assuming you share her theological uh, assumption or not. I mean... No, I'm not an atheist. You're not an atheist. Okay, were you, were you brought up religiously? <laughs> I was brought up with a very sort of patchy, uh, vaguely religious upbringing. I, we went to church intermittently, but mm -hmm. my parents weren't so fussy about which church. Okay, and so in what, 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 what belief prevents you from being an atheist? Um, if that's if that's a sufficiently unclear way of putting the question, yeah, no. Uh, I think to be an atheist, to call myself an atheist, I would have to be convinced that there was no God, and I'm not. Okay, so you're an agnostic, kind of. Like an agnotheist, maybe? Yeah, no, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what I am. I yeah. uh, I think about these questions a lot. I have no answers. But you do take higher purpose seriously. I do. Okay. And I suppose in that sense, maybe I do think that there's a God, because I do think that there's a higher purpose. So there is, there is moral... That exists outside of people. There is more, you think there is moral truth? I do. Okay. And yet, I'm in many ways a moral relativist. So, I, 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 do I contradict myself very well? I contradict myself. I contain multitudes. Okay, moral relativist in the sense of being reluctant to pass judgment on, like, other cultures who do things differently? Is that what you mean? I don't even know how you can get, I don't think that there is a point of view from which you can even critique another culture's beliefs in some sense, right? Is that the only way you can make the argument is from within your culture, which, defini which definitionally kind of doesn't understand the other. But don't you understand, we are part of the greatest culture in the greatest country. Hasn't anybody explained that to you, Megan? But, you know, that could be true, for all I know. <laughs> I I doubt it is, but you're right, it could be. Well, actually, let me say this, is that in fact, like, I like America better than any other culture. Well, yeah, it's, it's our home. It's our own, right, in the same way that you, you love your mother best. My mother is also objectively awesome, as is my mother. So is mine, actually. My mother is, in fact, probably better than yours, but we needn't get into that. I, I, I'm going to have to, I will fight you to the death. You, um, your cause is hopeless, but proceed. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I, I, I do think that, uh, I'm always suspicious of people go, who go to another country and start bashing their own. Um, you know, if your, if your own country has done something terrible to you, I'm, I'm not talking about people whose country has done something terrible to them. I am talking about just random upper middle class people who move somewhere else and then spend their whole time talking mm -hmm. about how terrible their home, home culture is. Mm -hmm. 
Um, they should have stayed put and done it. Yeah, you know, yeah. Well, in a in a way, right? It is very different. Complaining about your spouse is very different when you are doing it to your spouse than when you are doing it to another person. Like True. I, I don't. I also don't complain about my spouse to other people, other than like affectionate things. Everyone knows, like the fact that he, what I cook, he's much neater than I am, so he cleans up after me while I go. And this makes me crazy, and he knows it makes me crazy, but he can't stop. Uh, that, but he knows that. That's, I that's, that's, that's not a very searing indictment of a spouse, right. I would say, um, so you don't have to feel too guilty about that. Yes. No, but I mean, like, again, this is yeah, this is the sort of thing my family knows this about him, that he's compulsively neat. Yeah. He's, I'm sure knows about me that I'm compulsively not. Um, and those sorts of things. But other than that, like I, I, I don't think you should complain about your family outside of your family. Um, that in... In general, I, I, I think there are lots of things say, that you say to yourselves that are about improvement, and then there is gossiping about it outside. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not just talking about Americans who do this, right? Yes, I, I, when I was in London, I would have my teeth set on edge by these Americans who had moved there from Long Island like three months ago and picked up a quasi-British accent and then would do nothing mm -hmm. but complain about how horrifying everything about America was. Um, but, you know, the, and, and there, there's a great PGR work line about, like, uh, a woman who said to him, like, my God, nukes everywhere, what's wrong with you people? This, wo this woman had grown up in Long Island, right? It's, it's sort of... Right. Um, but also people from other countries, is that you should love your country. You should love the country that gave you birth in the way that you, you love your family. And if, if they abused you, um, or if they did something, you know, people who criticize Nazi Germany, fair enough. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't critique U.S. foreign policy. You shouldn't. I'm talking about running it down, of saying, like, oh, those people are terrible, they're all stupid, they're, you know. Um, I don't like it. Okay. But, you, but it sounds like I think you're also uh, not big on running other cultures down from the perch of your own culture. God, no. Yeah. What, what, what do you even know about the other culture? Right? Okay, if you've lived there for... 30 years and you want to come back and tell me about it, fine. Yeah. Um, but developing a strong opinion on what it's, what other cultures are like and what's wrong with them. Mm -hmm. Now, well, sorry, go ahead. No, it's just saying, you know, how would you know? And, and again, I'm not talking about, you, you can critique foreign policy of another country all you want. If they're, you know, tear gassing minorities or whatever, then yes, it is perfectly fair yeah. to critique the things that their government does or something. But saying that they're culturally bad, their culture, it's a terrible, violent, horrible, whatever culture, um, you have no idea what their culture is like. You have, you know, I mean, imagine some, someone from Pakistan who came to America for a week or didn't even come to America for a week presumed to know, think they knew what America was like because they'd watched a bunch of videos on YouTube. Mm -hmm. That's nutty. And in fact, the funny thing is like you, you, when you enter, when you live abroad, even briefly, you get this sense as you realize that, that people who are, um, people who think they know a lot about America because they watch our television right. and watch our movies. Right. And they get this very strange idea of what things are actually like in America. And then, funnily, so the things they don't believe are the things that are actually true. Like, British people, European people who come here, the first thing they always say is, my God, the cars really are that big. Like, they thought we were putting it on for movements, right? <laughs> um, but then the things that they don't get are that, you know, they think that, like, everyone's getting shot in the street all the time right. or, or whatever. It's like, no, the, that's dramatized for movies. And I live in a fairly, you know, it's, it's not the most dangerous neighborhood in D.C. by a long shot, but it's, it's not super safe either. We have shootings and so forth here. And trying to explain to people that, you know, no, actually, it's not that you walk around in this constant terror that you're going to get shot every time you walk around a corner. Mm -hmm. um, that, like, people get very strange ideas. And I often think about this with, like, men and women, which is that I wonder if women don't assume that they know more about men than we do because we watch a bunch of, movies that are made by men and books that are written by men and so forth. And so you mm -hmm. get the sense that you understand more about being a man than you do. And I've been thinking about this because um, one of my random purpose enhancing things as I've gotten into my forties is that I am suddenly and for no apparent reason 
uh, attempting to write a novel in my spare time. And some of the characters are male. Hmm. And I suddenly realized I just have to go and ask my husband stuff. Like, how would a guy think about this? Because I have no idea. Yeah, but you know, your husband's not going to tell you the truth. <laughs> no, husband says, it doesn't make sense for a husband to tell his wife the truth about, question, about all these things. This is a problem I've run into in trying to explain to women what men are like. Is they say, but my husband says that, you know, X. And I'm like, well, of course your husband's going to say that. So what are men like, Robert? I mean, tell They're me worse than your things. husband is telling you they are. Okay, so tell me something that is uh, worse than I, I think. I can't. My wife might watch this, and then she'd know. <laughs> um, but but I mean, that just highlights is that you, from the outside, it's easy to think that you have a very sort of comprehensive look at a culture. And then when you're inside, when you are actually inside of it, I think my perfect example of this was when I was in London, I was watching a BBC talk show. It was like one of these sort of McLaughlin groupy people sitting around looking very serious in, mm -hmm. in big soft chairs. And the host said, could a, Christ, could a non-Christian ever be elected to office, higher office in the United States, do you think? And they sat around watching this for 20 minutes and debating this question. And I was sitting there like la in increasingly incredulous and then I'm laughing and then I'm crying because it's so funny. And my economist colleagues looked at me like, what is so funny? And I said, they should invite Senator Lieberman onto the show and they could ask him. For example, yes. Who, who, like, who came this close like, to being vice president. It's like a totally crazy question. That, and it, this was not, by the way, in reference to his, this was in like 2004, and I don't mm -hmm. remember who the person they were talking about. It was not Joe Lieberman. Um, it was like a totally crazy question that I think makes sense if you have a certain filter, media and, and culture filter, through which you have consumed information about the United right. States, and is totally insane if you live here. And speaking of foreign cultures, I think I'm remembering correctly that you and I had a blogging heads conversation many years ago when you were either in Southeast Asia or had just returned from there. I, I forget what you, you were, in, you were there. And I think we talked about the kind of exhilaration of making contact with a, with a culture that's very different from your own, or you know, actually succeeding in communicating with people in this very different culture or something, right? Does that ring a bell? Yes, it does. And I think the thing that strikes you is like the ways in which even your sympathetic attempts to imagine how people will feel often fail. Mm -hmm. Right? Is that I assumed that the Vietnamese would be a lot angrier about Vietnam than they were. Mm -hmm. Right? And now, maybe they were and they weren't telling me. Maybe you're talking to the ones who won and so they maybe. weren't bitter. Right. I, like, you, you, I don't, but exactly. But I didn't understand it. Right. right? right. I was willing to pay penance, but they didn't want me to. So, right. you know, whatever the reason was, and I'm not going to essay a reason because I have no idea, is that that, you know, the things that loom largest for you are often not the things that loom largest for others and, the, and that, um, that you never really understand. And that's not to say that we shouldn't try to understand more. Mm -hmm. Just that you can't really get inside. And so, yes, it drives me nuts when people... It drives me nuts when people on the left talk about people in subcultures that they know nothing about other than, like, some, you know, one guy they met 20 years ago at college. But it's okay, it's okay with, but it's okay with the, people on the right do it, right? No, it drives <laughs> me nuts. When, I was about to say, I was leading off with... <laughs> I know. I, it drives me nuts when people on the right make generalizations about Islam... That yeah. I mean, some of them. So, like, some of them, I'm not even saying are false, yeah. right? That it's true that there were Palestinians who celebrated 9/11, and I'm going to establish my street cred here, which is that I, I I knew people who died in the towers, and I take 9/11 really really seriously. <laughs> I worked down at the recovery site for a year. It's, this is not, I'm not saying this because I just don't care about 9-11 and, and nor do I not understand why people got angry when they saw that. Um, but I can also understand that for Palestinians, right, that was really far away. And for them, what's up close and personal is violent conflict with Israel. And I don't want to get into the discussion about 
who's right and who's wrong in that conflict. I right. think it's like an endless, it's been going on for a very long time and trying to establish who hit who first and who's is, you will never resolve that argument. I'm not even saying I don't have an opinion. Right. I'm saying that like, no one's, no one, I'm not going to change anyone's mind on this. So I'm not going to. But people in general do think the other person hit first. And so, Always. And, and you know, they and, care and, more about it, right? They care more about what was done to them. They always have reasons that what was done to them is worse than what was done to the other side. And you know, when and, we when we dropped the bomb on uh, on Hiroshima, I think there was what we would consider it a shockingly little in the way of expressions of of ambivalence in in the United States. I mean, you know, and and the idea was, well, they started the war. And of course, even there, there's an argument. I mean, we had done things before the actual war started that they felt was a th threat, you know, embargoes or whatever, that they thought cut off their lifeline and so on. So it's two, side, two sides to who, to who hit first there. But I just think people have a tremendous capacity to shut down their uh, moral right. sensibilities. And so taking those videos as an indictment of, like, these are just bloodthirsty people who are terrible, like, People celebrated when we bombed stuff in Afghanistan for the same right, reason, right. which is that they felt like this was a blow against people who had done something terrible to us. Right. I'm not talking about the accuracy of this. I'm just saying, like, this is how people are. Yeah. It's not special to the Palestinians. It's not special to anyone. This is how people are. When they're hit, they want to hit back. And that, you know, so those kinds of commentary, th those kinds of comments just make me crazy. That the people who... Yeah, you're you're looking at one moment. You're not looking at all of the moments when those people, right. in some ways, you know, undoubtedly do things better and worse than Americans, right? Like, you know, I, I you, you talk to Arabs about family, right? And to them, family is both simultaneously much closer and tighter, and more generous and so forth, and also much more restrictive and and you know, cutting into your life than it is here. But whatever it is, right, is that you can't tell because of the four moments that you manage to watch. The only way you really know is to be in it. Right. Um, and so it's hard to make moral judgments on another culture or on people who are doing things by the lights of another culture. Right. And I do think that one way to do God's work, so to speak, metaphorically, is to illuminate the perspective of other cultures and other people, and, and make people in any country better at seeing things from the perspective of people in any other country or culture or religion or whatever. But it's hard, and I'm not even sure it's possible in some way, right? There's no, you never shed. It's hard. I don't think you can, there are lots of things that are universal, right? Like, everyone loves babies, everyone... Yeah, but that's an example. If you can point to the universal, I mean, sometimes if you can show somebody in a different culture, in Iran or something, just loving their baby, that, the, you know, you can, you can, if you can show people that people everywhere are at some level the same in the sense of their basic needs and drives and, the th and so on, I think sometimes that, that makes progress and opens people up to a perspective. But maybe I'm wrong. You, 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 you seem to think I'm naive. No, I don't think you're naive. I just think it's it's sort it's of hard. A, it's Sisyphean work, right? You are right. never. Well, what what what's the easiest way to open people's eyes is I think uh, I shouldn't get off of my hobby horse. I'll shut up right after this. But <clears throat> put them in a non-zero sum relationship with somebody. If they think they can like benefit from doing business with people, or they're on the same team in some sense, then they're then they're very good at appreciating the perspective of the person. But once they put somebody in that zero sum category, that you know they think of them as a threat or an enemy or whatever, then they just, they do not want to think of them as fully human. Well, but in some ways that's necessary, right? Is that like, if you look at evolution. Oh, oh, it's a, it's a product of evolution. But it, it's also, you know, it still operates, is that yeah. groups are really successful. And how do you build a group? A group is definitionally, yeah. it's both us and it's not, and it, it's not, not us. Right. And, and, like, we would like not not us to go away, and I don't think that that's possible. Well, but, that, but well, uh, we, I, I, you keep getting me back on my hobby horse. We're, um, but we are at a point in history, once you reach the global level of social organization, which is only starting to happen, you have to figure out a way for there to be us without a not us, at least without a not us that you're at lethal war with, right? I don't think not not us. I don't think that not us has to be someone you're at war with. It's just okay. always the people who you aren't, right? And you look at like 
tighter communities are formed are minority communities. Yeah. That's just generally true, right? You look at religious minority communities like the Orthodox or whatever, they're very strong communities. There are a lot of great things about that. There are drawbacks to living in a community that's that tight. You know, my mother moved out of a small town because she didn't want to be uh, her father's daughter for the rest right. of her life. Um, but the it's always defined by the people who aren't like you as much as it is, you know, as well as the people who are. Because the effort of staying, of fending those people off in some ways, mm-hmm. right? You look at what's happening to historically black colleges and universities right now. It's very sad. Is that a lot of these institutions, which have for decades had very strong institutional cultures and so forth, they're suffering now mm-hmm. precisely because black students can now go anywhere. And that's great. I am not saying that like we should have kept segregation but there is a loss as well as a gain. Mm-hmm. And the loss is these strong community institutions and the richness of being in a small culture. And I, I think about that with, you know, sort of Irish Catholic America, right? I am glad that the few times I've ever heard people say bigoted things about Irish Catholics, uh, really like only a couple times in my life, I found them funny. And the way, but you know, the reason I found them funny was that it doesn't matter anymore. Right. And if I were living in 1960, I wouldn't find it funny because it did. Yeah. And that like we lost, but now what you see in my generation, and especially in the generation after us, is that this, like when I went to school, there was a strong sense among Irish American kids, not all of them, but a lot of them, of being Irish American, Mm -hmm. of having that be kind of like an important part of your historical identity. And I don't see that in people who are, say, 10 or 20 years younger than me, is that we lost that because now the people, the people who remember the discrimination are your grandparents. Right. And, and there were great things about it. There were great things about that sense of tight self. Um, and there were also major drawbacks in terms of not being able to outmarry and all the rest of it. So I don't want to... But, like, that there's always a loss when that happens. And so... Um, I don't think I don't know that I think we're going to get to some level of global community where where there's going to be a not where we're going to get rid of not us. I just don't. No, think not in all senses of the term, but there, I think there's some minimal sense in which we're going to have to do it if there's going to be a global, a cohesive uh, global community, as opposed to descent into chaos and death. Now, speaking of death, we've uh, already been on. I've, you've talked generously much longer than I told you you would have to talk. So. Uh, we should probably wrap it up, but what better way to wrap it up than uh, to visit the subject of death? Um, what, uh, how do you, no, I shouldn't ask you how you feel I'm about death. To People it. don't like death, but, but, but if, if you're not, okay, so you're not a pure atheist, but you're also not a religious believer who has some clear sense of an afterlife or anything. Uh, so given that, you're also not old enough to have to think a whole lot about death if you don't want to, but, um, how do you feel about confronting death with some sort of equanimity and consolation, even without the assurance of some afterlife? Oh, I don't think I shall. I expect I'll be terrified and it'll be horrible. There you go. That's... Um, I don't... Although, you know, I, I have to say, like, so... My mother recently said to me... She said... I said, I'm terrified of dying. And she said... I used to be that way too, but you know, you get older and you can't do as much and, um, and it's not as frightening as it used to be. And I think that that's probably true is that by the time, if you die of old age, yeah, that a, the, I, 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 I am, I am, I am citing someone else who told me that she feels this it way. It is somewhat true, but, um, speaking as a person who's older than you, I can say it's somewhat true, but at the same time, if you Paid attention, you'll see that people fight until the end. Almost nobody seems to want the plug pulled until it's really, until maybe there's just really nothing left. You know what, I, I mean, people are eager to keep living under extremely adverse circumstances. And yep. it's impressive, it's impressive, it's inspiring in some ways. But do I face death with equanimity? And sort of, no. 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 Not mm-hmm. at all. Um... I basically try not to think about it as much well, as you, possible. Well, do you think you'll get consolation out of the things we've discussed, having done work that you think complied with uh, moral guidelines deriving from some source we know not which? Yes. 
And of course, I will get uh, regret out of the things that were undone. But uh, I expect to take it. I expect to take consolation in uh, in the things I've had, and I've been extraordinarily lucky. So I can't really. Um, I, I will I will go to my grave with more than my share of uh, of spiritual riches, okay. and doubt upon me by others, not. Not earned. Not earned. It's grace, as they say in Christian Indeed. doctrine. Grace. Um, okay, well, thank you so much uh, for opening up. Well, thank you for having me. Okay, and we will, uh, I hope, to, hope, hope we'll do this again sometime. Absolutely. Okay.